Hello everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne again, uh, taking a look at chapter 3 in the auto textbook. Um, the nice thing about this chapter is that we think about all of that we've learned about with language development in chapters 1 and 2 and some of the discussions we've had in class and some of the activities and we think about what happens when we integrate diversity and culture into this discussion about language and language development. Um, so there were two basic summaries that I had that I wanted to focus on for the week. The first of which is that, you know, when our students come into class with different languages or different dialects, they are uh, authentic or valid forms of communication. Sometimes we think that, um, you know, when someone is different or other than uh, us uh, or, you know, uses a different language or a different dialect then they are either smarter or less smart than we are. Um, sometimes other and different are not viewed as good things. Um, we need to understand that different forms of language and different dialects are authentic and valid forms of communication in our classroom. Um, we also need to know that SLA or, or second language acquisition requires the same factors that we have uh, that we use as students acquire and they use their first language. Um, so in this discussion, I want to basically start where we ended last week um, and think about the, the synapses in the brain. And we know that um, when we form thoughts and we lump those thoughts together and we, you know, pull all these thoughts together into our semantic uh, mapping in our brain um, and we create syntax, we are firing individual little synapses and then clusters of these synapses add up to thoughts and language and communication. Um, so we start with something that's very, very infinitesimally small, and then we scale up um, through the Bronf and Brenner's uh, theory, uh, ecological theory heuristic. We take a look at the way that culture and uh, other forces basically impact those initial synapses and the firing of the synapses. So we see the complexity that happens as we move up from the synapse to thought to language to communication to how does that communication interact with culture and what society is saying and culture is saying and religion is saying is uh, social political systems are saying so what are all these different elements and how do they impact um, what we do with language um, so in terms of culture and language there are you know complex relationships that occur between uh, culture and language. Um, the superior war hypothesis is basically thinking that our, our world is primarily determined by our language and, and our use of, of words and communication. Uh, we understand that there are culturally specific language forms um, and in social linguistics that's basically what we study. We look at language behavior, social situations, roles, functions, um, norms, uh, and figure out what do those things um, hold and then how much of it's determined by language and literacy. Um, we started talking about this in class. We looked at the, the interactions that we have and what we've learned in chapters one and two and that what changes when we integrate culture. A lot of you said that everything changes. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I agree or disagree with that. Um, the second question was basically are there different uh, roles or attitudes or aptitudes or is there a different social contract um, when we move from children to adults or adults to children? Are there different expectations? And then last but not least, what are we missing um, as we start talking about culture and language? Um, and some of you in class indicated that this was a tough question um, and that's good. I think that we need to sit down and think about, you know, what might be we, what what might we be missing in this discussion? Because I think that we're always missing something. Uh, we don't want to just leave our blinders on and think that we had the only perspective and we understand most of what this uh, perspective entails. Um, the chapter three in Otto basically talks about different forms of language uh, development and the research conducted to understand language development uh, and, and how culture impacts it. My perspective on this is primarily I want you to understand the research and, and the different types of research and how it impacts what's happening, but more to the point, this will impact uh, one of our assessments in class. So ethnography, uh, they talk about Heath's work, 
Uh, ethnography is basically participant observation in a real life situation. So it's you as a researcher uh, primarily observing uh, things that are happening in the real. Uh, you're studying a, a, a context and you're looking at social cultural factors and trying to understand what's happening there. Longitudinal research is looking at development over time. You're looking at uh, one individual or a group of individuals or a societal mix looking over time and seeing what these people are doing over the course of days, months, years. Um, the example I gave in class is that I've conducted or wanted to conduct some longitudinal research looking at pre-service teachers and take a look at what you're learning in the pre-service program and then what happens when you go out and you are teaching. So for the most part, I'm not really concerned with what you do in the pre-service program, and I'm not really that concerned with what you do as a student teacher. I want to see what you're doing your first, second, and third years teaching. Um, so what that means is I have to be there for when you're, you're learning in your pre-service classes, um, maybe, maybe not observe you in student teaching, but then I definitely want to see what you're doing, um, and I want to come out and observe you and have dialogue uh, when you're teaching to see what effect your teaching program had on what you're doing in the classroom. Um, socialization mismatch theory, they talk about this in, in auto. Uh, the thinking is, or the, the, the idea is that there is, um, you know, in, in situations where children have a socialization pattern that is similar to what's happening in, in home and school, that they can be successful, but if there's a challenge or, or uh, a disagreement in the socializ socialization pattern, uh, then children might struggle. Uh, what this means is, you know, basically if a child is at home and they are empowered and they are asked to speak up all the time and they are engaged in dialogue with parents and siblings and out in the community and then they go to school and they are asked to basically uh, zip their lips and not really talk, there's going to be some challenges and some students might have um, difficulty uh, moving from home to school or school to home. Um, so they're basically, the hypothesis is that uh, if you want students to succeed, they have to be, the socialization patterns need to be similar or, or mimic one another. What I'm really interested about in the socialization mismatch theory is the different patterns of talk that they observe in these placements. Um, and these are things that I, I think we'll focus on for our, our uh, one of our assessments. Um, but basically, you know, how much talk is there? What's the amount of talk in the environment? How much are children asked to participate in, in the conversation as a partner? Uh, are children provided with opportunities to explain their interpretation or their side of the story um, with others? What types of questions are we using in the environment? Um, and then what types of text or what types of narrative, what forms of narrative are being used? Is it fiction, nonfiction, ongoing narrative, uh, multimodal text? What sort of text and, and narrative devices are we using or is the teacher using across these elements? And then, you know, what, what is being used in the home? Uh, in terms of what this means for the classroom, obviously you can enhance language development. You know, as students are learning one language, they can... Uh, expand their understanding of that language and, and you know even if they're picking up a second language at the same time um, there's also a certain amount of flexibility that children can build in as they're learning a new language um, so that in the future they can communicate in a wide variety of settings they can be flexible learners they can think and be critical and understand other opportunities for them uh, to share and communicate with other learners globally um, we take a little bit of a pivot and we look at language diversity um, and, and what that really means. That's where Otto spends most of the time in Chapter 3. Um, so in terms of language diversity, we're looking at specific differences. Um, you know, in, in, I'll start at the bottom here in language. If we view language as, a, as, a, as an example of the ability to acquire and use complex systems of communication, so there's differences in, in languages, there's differences in register, uh, so that's language use for a particular purpose or, or in different social settings, and then dialect. Uh, we definitely see diversity of language 
if we don't see it in, in specific languages, then we see it in dialect. We see it in particular forms of languages, uh, particular to uh, regions or social groups. So one of the activities that we're going to do in class is we're going to take a look at idioms and we're going to look at figures of speech. And sometimes in a second language classroom, an English language learner classroom, an EL classroom, figures of speech are, are difficult for people to understand if they're not inculcated in the culture. Um, so when we say to you know someone that they should play by ear or um, you know to you toot your own horn. Uh, if you're not from the culture and you don't understand the setting, you might be a little bit um, confused. You might not really understand what do you mean by playing something by ear. Uh, so in class, we'll talk about what some idioms are and, and what we have in, you know, encountered in our own history. And then why might this confuse a, an EL, an English language learner? Um, you know, why might this be difficult for them? Um, in terms of dialect, you know, we have specific differences in dialect. There's different uh, cultural, social, geographic influences that uh, impact language and our use of language. Um, we have different systematic features. So if we look at phonological, uh, if you see a, a path of water that goes between a, 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 a ravine or between a set of trees, that could be a, a creek or a creek. Um, there's semantic meaning, so you might have a drinking fountain or a water fountain, or in some places a bubbler um, or a bubbla, as some people would say. Um, syntactic, I, I don't have help, or I can't get no help, or I have no time to help, um, you know, or morphemic changes, it, I'm going to, or gonna, or I'm gonna. Uh, different uh, dialects, different specialized variations of a language that you would say in different parts of the world. Uh, other challenges with dialects, um, there are regional differences. There are, you know, even if we have standard American English, there might be uh, different places in the U.S. Um, or even globally uh, that you have different dialects. You know, it's still American English, but there's different flavor on it. Um, you know, one of the things that they talk about in Otto uh, is uh, African American English or Black English. Um, you know, we, we think about uh, the impact of that form of language. It still is standard American English, but there is a specific dialect, um, and it causes challenges in the classroom um, to see where teachers and students fall on the continuum in the use of these dialects. Um, but the good thing about it all is that in our classrooms, this encourages our kids to be flexible um, and, and uh, be dialect by dialectic, um, have different languages, use two languages or more. Um, and probably most importantly, and this goes into things that we learn about in human growth and development, in ed psych and sociology, is that it's in, in, incumbent on the teacher to, and other students in the class, but really the teacher, to create a culture in the classroom where we recognize and value different dialects and home languages of every kid. Um, so they're coming in with a rich tapestry, a rich narrative at their own homes. And the dialects that they bring in are just evidence of that tapestry that they have in their homes. Uh, different language registers. Um, and once again, a register is just a, a social setting or a specific way of using language differently in different social settings. Um, you know, it, it impacts our use of language in different ways. Uh, so we have conversations, we have social routines, we have classroom discourse. So you're going to use language different ways in different places. You know, you you and your students will use language differently if you are out at a baseball game or if you're at a church or if you're out at the mall or if you're at dinner um, or if you're sitting in class. The hope is that, yes, you do use language differently and you have different social norms and social routines that you use, and language is just one part of that. Um, also within uh, one of the challenges is that in an academic setting, in, in classrooms, academic English is used for specific purposes. Um, there's certain meanings that we have, there are certain ways that we direct one another, there are certain ways that we use language in a discussion as opposed to a question-answer situation, um, and 
part of the challenge is that we need to teach our students not only to read and write and communicate using academic English, but we also have to show them or teach them the different uh, aspects of register when they're using these uh, language features. Uh, in terms of the use of academic English and, and how it applies to register in this discussion about register, um, there's a number of challenges. Um, first of which is that it is primarily, at least here in the U.S., and increasingly globally it's true, and increasingly on the Internet, that it's a, a language of instruction. Um, you know, it's, it's related to academic achievement. So majority of, you know, informational texts that are online and majority of information and instruction um, and academic achievement is presented and it's written in English. You know, and English is the language used uh, as, you know, for speech. Uh, and so in order to, you know, read or write or communicate or listen to or share verbally in this discussion, you need to know and understand academic English in order to be a part of this conversation. Um, and in, so in that sense, it's a language of power. You either know how to use the English language and you, uh, you know, academic English specifically, and you can be part of that discussion, or you're left out. Um, and so that has a chance to empower, but also disempower uh, a lot of uh, students, a lot of learners, um, both young and old. Um, and so that's something that we always need to be aware of in our classrooms. Uh, the, the teacher's role in all this is you need to encourage students to think about those different settings. You need to think about their use of register and how they're using different language and different social settings and what decisions are they making and help them correct those or be at least aware of it so that they can modify um, their use of language. In terms of second language acquisition or SLA, um, this provides opportunities for students to learn knowledge and skills, they develop competencies, they, uh, you provide them with other opportunities to uh, think about their use of language as a communication device. Uh, as students become bilingual as they are involved in second language acquisition or SLA, um, we see different forms of that. So the first is simultaneous bilingual, bilingualism. Um, that's, you know, picking up at least two languages straight from birth. Um, it's a, you know, the student's born into a dual language or a bilingual classroom, I mean, born into a bilingual home, um, and they immediately are picking up at least two different languages. Uh, successive bilingualism is when you have additional languages added or exposure to additional languages at age three or older. Um, then we see it's, it's called language interference. It's sometimes referred to as L1 interference or linguistic interference or cross-linguistic interference. Um, but basically what we're looking at is speakers or writers of uh, one language applying knowledge from that one language to another language. Uh, so it's sort of transfer of understanding of that language and context of the language and register and dialect of the language. You know, understanding what makes one language special and is used in one language to another. So you sort of see these different contextual pieces in a language interfering or crossing over to another space. Um, and then the, the last piece on there is, is one that I always find fascinating, you know, code mixing or code switching. Um, it's two or more languages or varieties in speech. Now keep in mind when we talk about varieties, it might be variety in uh, register or variety in um, context or variety in dialect or language. Um, but what we see is, you know, you're, you're mixing up uh, different forms of language as the, the student or the adult speaks. So the way that you sometimes see this is a student will, um, you know, talk one way uh, when their friends are there and automatically switch when they know an adult is there. Um, they'll, they'll mix up the way that they use register. They, they mix up the, the use of dialect, um, sometimes to share and communicate and sometimes to obfuscate or stop some people in the discussion from understanding. Um, an example of this is when I'm talking, you know, adults are talking to one another and then all of a sudden they they know the child is there and they don't want the child to understand what's being discussed. And so they'll start like spelling out words or speaking other 
languages or dialect or you know obfuscating communication so that the other person, the child in the room, doesn't understand what's being said. Um, a lot of benefits of bilingualism. Uh, it's challenging to, to understand. It's challenging to uh, make sure that we are in control of it in our classroom. But um, for one, it, it has higher levels. It you know provides students with higher le levels of metalinguistic awareness. Students are aware that there are broader cultures and perspectives um, and integrated you know social skills across these spaces. Um, it, it has it, it provides opportunities for our students to realize that the, the world is a diverse place and there is a rich tapestry uh, of culture and society and skill and language that exists across these different spaces. Um, so there's a lot of benefit uh, in providing this. Um, in class, we're going to have an activity where we basically unpack different forms of uh, second language acquisition. One of the things that we need to understand is, you know, in the video that we've watched online and we've had discussions about, uh, the immersion school is just one way for us to figure out opportunities to work with second language learners, uh, English language learners, and figure out ways to support them. Um, you know, there are different models. There are many different models. Sometimes um, you'll see school systems that will within one building to have two or three different models going at the same time. Um, so you could have uh, the ESL program, uh, English as a second language, you could have a TBE or transitional bilingual program, you could have full immersion programs, submersion programs, um, you know, foreign language in elementary school, you could have different programs, different initiatives all happening across buildings, across one building, across districts. These are different models um, that have different goals and different students at the focus of it. So in class, we'll work collaboratively to make more sense of this and then have discussion and dialogue about what does this really mean. Um, in terms of your role as the teacher, it, it, one of the big takeaways from the whole chapter and, and my thinking, you know, at least what I'd like you to take away from the, the piece, is that there are different ways for you as the teacher to think about a bilingual environment um, or a multilingual environment. Um, the first of which is take a look at your own perspective. You know, how do you feel about this? Are you open-minded about it? Are you closed-minded? You know, going back to the beginning of this uh, slide deck, you know, do you value different dialects and different registers? Do you value different, um, you know, diverse uh, languages and diverse peoples in your classroom, or is it a hindrance? Um, you know, what is your perspective? What is your belief set on this? Um, I would say that the second bullet point is, you know, to, to work uh, diligently to create a positive classroom environment, create a classroom environment that is welcoming to different dialects, and you encourage your students to test out different dialects, to code switch, to play with register as a device in language, but also at the same time keeping them accountable. Um, you know, allow them to play with language, but at the same time make sure that they understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, and see what effect it has on their growth as learners, as, as literate individuals. Um, also, build on their first language competencies. If their first language is English, Keep building on it. Maybe you can immerse and, and build in some other exposure to a second language. Um, if they're coming into your room as an English learner or a second language learner, um, you know, if they're an EL student in your classroom, how are you building up opportunities for them to, to learn English but also supporting what they already know? Um, you know, just in the same way a child might come into your room and, and you know, be six, seven years old and already have a couple of years experience using English in the home, in community, in learning such, uh, learning settings, you know, you use that experience as a tool to talk about language and study literacy. Why not take a look at a student that has the same amount of experience in a different language and think about how you can use those years of experience to support them in your classroom as learners. Um, sometimes it could be challenging, sometimes it could be a little uh, scary about 
you know, teaching about something that we don't entirely know about. So if we don't know a lot about Spanish culture or Mandarin or, um, you know, different cultures around the world, how do you support learners when you don't fully know? One of the ways is that you can just open up as a learner. Um, so the last is create a learning community. Create a place in your classroom, as we said in bullet two, that it's positive, it's a positive environment, but it's a place where kids want to learn and you are learning along with them. Um, and that's one of the best things that we could possibly do with our students.